Colonial time is never singular. The colonial occupation of space would be impossible without the simultaneous domination of time. According to Dan Tun Yang, the conquest of space is intrinsically tied to the mastery of time. The need to master time reveals that time is not given, but is constantly developed, patterned, and split. While much attention has been given to technologies that enable the conquest of space, it is important to consider colonial mechanisms that attempt the conquest of time. In the case of Imperial Russia, the Trans-Siberian Railway is a simple example of one such control mechanism. The railway exists as both physical infrastructure and a mechanism of temporal control. Throughout the 10,000 kilometers span of the railway, running through colonized territories, the station clock at each and every stop displayed the same time as in St. Petersburg. This universalized temporal order was an attempt to solidify the colonial conquest of space. As the example of the railway shows, infrastructures pattern time. In the words of Kyle Stein and Axel Wolmer, temporalities are hardwired. They are materialized within infrastructures. From the measurement and management of civilians to the synchronization of military systems, colonial regimes use time as a weapon. Colonial powers have developed a distinctive set of mechanisms to pacify populations through the use of time. However, an understanding of these mechanisms can reveal how time imposes its own rules on colonialism. Therefore, we understand colonialism as a complex system that encompasses temporal principles, both desirable and undesirable. With a focus on the Russian colonial regime, we will identify four of these temporal mechanisms. These are linearity, latency, recursion, and finitude. Recursion. How can we envisage the end of such a complex entanglement of temporalities that constitutes colonialism? As we've discussed, linearity is a way for colonial rule to disguise itself as inevitable. Latency embodies how long-lasting effects of colonialism contaminate both past and future. Both linearity and latency are efficient control mechanisms. However, there are other aspects of colonial time that are inherently self-defeating. I explore this through the concepts of recursion and finitude. Colonial warfare rests on the idea that it has tools to control time. Imperial powers like to think of themselves as massive machines that can bend time and space as they want. They imagine colonial invasions as fast battles to be won without much effort. Colonial regimes have developed an intricate sensorial apparatus, eyes and brazen on missiles, bones, rifles, rovers, to impose speed. Thinkers of speed and acceleration follow the military lingua that believes in fast victories. What is described by Palvarelli's dromology, the capacity to dominate the enemy through speed, has been called small wars by military thinkers since the 19th century. Such focus on speed misses the bigger pattern. These wars are recursive, even if fought fast. Racial superiority aspirations of quick victories face reality that the chances of colonial victory in these wars is around one-third or even less than that. According to several extensive surveys of colonial invasions by the infamous U.S. military think tank Rand Corporation, it is as likely that the colonial invasion will be totally defeated as it is that is going to be won. 30% of victories seem surprisingly low for what is presented as undefeatable war machine that has technological solutions for any problem that battlefield presents. Military budgets of Russia, Israel, USA, truly astronomical in size, somehow do not translate into power 
that would break the colonial resistance once and for all. To understand how these colonial wars are defeated, one should focus on recursion rather than speed. As Anne Laura Stuller suggested in her book on imperial durabilities, recursion is not exactly the same as repetition of identical scenarios and mistakes. Recursion is redeployment, recombination of the tools and means of colonial violence. It corresponds to the etymology of the word time, vreme, in Russian. In Proto-Slavic, the word for time, vreme, meant something that spins, that comes back to its initial position. Such recursive spinning is very apparent in colonial wars. Colonial invasions spin in the same direction. The Soviet war in Afghanistan waged from 1979 to 1989, despite all the enormous military resources thrown at it, was ultimately unsuccessful. It was spinning for a whole decade to come to the initial position. The same fate awaited Russia in its first invasion in Chechnya between 1994 and 1996. Technologies might change, but the tendency for the empire to be defeated remains. War criminals, weapons, strategies are quite literally redeployed from one war to another. They bring with them shortages, breaks, misconceptions that turn the tide of the conflict in the known direction. Colonial wars do not repeat themselves in the exact same manner, but they carry the ghosts of the past. And so, the dead of one war haunt the dead of another. Even though today's military personnel can see these ghosts through infrared goggles, their augmented senses do not protect them from specters. Instead, they welcome them into the same patterns of death. Death from friendly fire is the most telling example of how deaths repeat each other. Also referred to as fratricide, friendly fire is the act of troops accidentally killing each other. Unsurprisingly, it is a taboo subject in the military. Ironically, deaths from friendly fire are the result of military attempts to prevent future deaths. Ways to stop friendly fire are the ones to cause deaths in future battles. Despite being rarely discussed, for a colonial soldier to be killed by another colonial soldier is a common way to die. The numbers of those deaths are extremely underreported due to the danger they present for the colonial state. Accepting how widespread the friendly fire is would shake the core propaganda narratives essential for recruiting soldiers and legitimizing these wars. Nevertheless, official reports estimate the friendly fire accounts for between 26 to 50% of all deaths in colonial forces. Soldiers acknowledge that friendly fire is part of everyday combat. One can see various traces of this. In 2008, when Russia launched a military aggression against Georgia, it lost six military jets, but only three of them were shot down by Georgian forces. The other half were downed by Russian themselves. Russian soldiers who invaded Afghanistan share how common the killings of fellow soldiers were. This is repeated in Russian accounts of the wars in Chechnya. On New Year's Day in 1995, two columns of Russian troops proceeded in parallel, storming through the streets of Grozny, killing each other while destroying the city. Deaths, the grim aftermath of colonial wars, do not have clear-cut beginnings and ends. As Karen Kaplan observed regarding the term aftermath, Aftermath only recently gained the grim meaning of what is left after the war. Aftermath initially was meant to obey the agricultural cycle. It meant cutting a second crop of grass to then be harvested. The moth in aftermath is the act of mowing. As colonial powers deeply believe they have power to break the rhythmic cycles of war, they push themselves into more and more deadly traps. They stayed, I quote, that friendly fire is a curse. Military thinkers themselves admit that the friendly fire is a product of highly efficient industrialized war. Soldiers do not engage in hand-to-hand combat 
and unless, unlike less well-trained militaries, shoot at each other without looking or thinking twice. Colonial powers try to break the curse of death by making people more efficient, more deadly. It makes a circle. We start following this circle. They state, friendly fire is caused by the fog of war, lack of reliable information of who is the enemy and where it is located. They throw more information on soldiers and their weapons, making them kill faster and more efficiently. Contemporary missiles turned into computers with explosives speed up the pace of war. Instead of breaking the cycle, they make the war cycle faster while broadcasting it on multiple screens. Assured by GPS and lasers, colonial soldiers now feel more confident to slaughter each other. Recursivity of imperial violence, as Anne Laura Stoller suggested, is marked by, I quote, contingent quality of histories that fold back on themselves and, in that refolding, reveal new surfaces and new planes. It opens to novel possibilities, ready to be seized by decolonial resistance. A Russian soldier who took part in the second war in Chechnya in the late 90s recalls the guerrilla resistance, actively staged friendly fire among Russian militaries. Russians, oblivious in their fantasies of savage Chechen warriors, could not believe that Chechen resistance were hacking their radio networks, broadcasting false fire positions in clear Russians, in clear Russian, confident in their drones, electronic weapons, and other regalia of technological superiority Russians simply could not admit the fact that Chechen resistance was actively hacking them. And so, colonial wars spin in the same direction, and colonial troops still kill each other. And so, the histories of colonial assault, folding on themselves, form space for the struggle. Finitude. The other self-defeating aspect of colonial time, besides recursion, is its hardwired finitude. An empire is a finite structure. Colonialism is susceptible to temporal fragility. Its ends are certain. Nevertheless, its ends are multiple, as are the timescales they occupy. Is it possible to, in the words of Ariel Aisha Azale, envision beginnings and ends of colonialism? Time is a volatile construct in which colonialism is not guaranteed eternity. Colonial regimes usually think of themselves as immune to the flow of time, but we are already familiar with the images of colonial projects decay. These images, appealing to viewers as ruin porn, have strong political meaning hidden behind their heavy isolation. Crimean nuclear power plant, one of such ruins, presents a promising case to look into their politics. Constructed by the Soviet state, it was never finished assessed to be built on a highly unstable ground. It is important that its construction was not stopped by geological, but political forces. The Russian state, inflicting nuclear catastrophe on Ukraine in the Chernobyl disaster, was scared of unrest. One can imagine the reaction the Soviet state would get by planting another nuclear ticking bomb on Ukrainian soil. With the end of the Soviet government, this ruin was appropriated by the Ukrainian and international youth. It was used in 1998 for the rave of one of the most popular post-Soviet festivals, Kazantiv, which with every year became even more mainstream. Dancing bodies in one's failed attempts of colonial conquest is one telling example of colonial finitude. What is important about finitude? If we're attentive to its patterns and fluctuations, we can welcome the obsolescence of colonialism. By enhancing the waves that cross the fabric of time, we can actively destabilize colonial regimes. The etymology of Russian word time, время, contains the traces of these waves. Recursive время, with its meaning of time spinning in cycles, which we talked about earlier, switched to время. Время focuses the definition of time on its temporary nature, showing it as volatile and transitory. Время means an interim swath of time far from having any connotations of eternity. One of the central technologies that sustain colonial regimes are their infrastructures. They have patterns of time hardwired in them. 
bridges, railroads, internet cables, sports, roads, cellular towers are essential for the colonial authorities to radiate and enforce their power. Colonial infrastructures control the flow of critical commodities like people and information. Being the heart of the empire, they're meant to be protected from any possible threat. These threats range from the colonial resistance to militant anarchists, but do not tend to include time. Let's take a closer look at colonial infrastructures. As we can see from the movements of the military bridge, offensive military infrastructures never pretend to be durable. Despite facilitating enormous flows of colonial power, they're explicitly built to be dismantled and taken away to follow the invasion. This comes in contrast with settler colonial infrastructures usually portrayed to stay functional for centuries. These infrastructures are usually presented to less for inhumane spans of time, despite being as volatile and transitory as military ones. Let's take as an example the Crimean Bridge, erected by Russia to cement annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. The Crimean Bridge, that currently allows direct movement between the peninsula and Russia, is stated to last for more than 100 years. Such a number is not objective, rather it is a political tool meant to hide the temporal fragility of infrastructure. Temporal fragility is a constant need of infrastructures and maintenance and repair to stop their decay, analyzed by Kavita Ramakrishnan, Kathleen O'Reilly, and Jessica Bunn. Similarly to the military bridge, dismantled to follow colonizers, the civilian bridge of settlers needs constant maintenance and repair to prevent its dismantling. Roads, bridges, buildings that comprise colonial settlement will decay and crumble without a constant influx of labor supporting their existence. They are no less mobile and temporary than military infrastructures are. We tend to think of them otherwise because that like colonialism tries to camouflage itself on a different temporal scale. Settler colonialism tries to hide itself in time to last for long enough to stay beyond comprehension. Settler colonialism weaponizes time to obscure its finitude. Finitude is hardwired into colonialism. However, this does not mean that colonialism will end by itself. Linearity and latency are powerful and efficient mechanisms which can only be countered by the logic of recursion and finitude. These temporal mechanisms can activate hardwired obsolescence and bring about the ends of colonial time. Thank you. We also invite the audience um, to give us comments or questions as well. Um, I think we really wanted to go back and, and really bring it down to ground so we can actually openly discuss uh, the situation at this moment. Um, I also wanted to bring back how GeoCinema started, which was in 2018 in Stroka Institute in Moscow, Stroka Institute of uh, art and design and architecture. Um, I think, especially these weeks, I remember uh, the silence uh, whenever the topic of colonialism occurred um, within the institute. Um, I think Stroka Institute was always outlined as a safe space for us students to discuss these political matters, uh, and yet it still was not being had. Um, I think Asia was very brave and quick to point out uh, this aggressive silence, uh, as well as how, for example, a Russian student would just assume Ukraine as part of Russia within one of his projects. Uh, and so just in terms of also within referencing colonialism as a, as a concept, as a term, it was always appropriated uh, with a European uh, connotation of, of um, colonialism rather than anything related to Russia itself and um, its own context. So I think 
I want to address um, both for Sasha and Anna to start the conversation around how art and culture is often acting as complicit within the normalization of violence, but also the, the more long-term work uh, that continues after the, after the war uh, with cultural institutions. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to start uh, and before I mm, continue talking about anything, I wanted to point out that I'm, mm, I'm Russian. So I would like definitely say that when I talk uh, about uh, Russian culture as something complicit uh, in uh, colonialism, I talk about the culture in which uh, I was also educated in and the culture uh, which um, and I was brought up in. So it so uh, it's important to point out that as like a Russian. Uh, decolonial uh, researchers, uh, as a Russian decolonial researcher, I'm also uh, complicit in that. Uh, but uh, the, the work uh, that uh, I feel um, that needs to be done to uh, undo Russian colonialism on the part of uh, culture is uh, thinking about uh, it um, on a quite a long term as something that uh, made uh, colonial invasion uh, not only possible, uh, but uh, also mm, comfortable for uh, its, uh, and uh, on, a, like, uh, on a simple level, uh, so one can, uh, one can imagine uh, Soviet posters, one can imagine uh, porcelain, one can imagine uh, Soviet uh, pictures that uh, mm, they, then they can go in two directions. Uh, firstly, uh, they will portray colonizers as uh, someone extremely heroic, someone, uh, and they, by thus normalizing the conquest of land and making it mm, something mm, normal, not only normal, but uh, also something that uh, one should be proud of. Uh, but uh, secondly, uh, as a, and it's also important to point out, uh, especially talking about it in English, uh, the, mm, the way uh, they per, uh, portray the, the notion of friendship of people that uh, emerged, that was uh, mm, developed through culture and how this uh, notion uh, concealed the uh, ongoing colonial violence and, uh, and on... Mm, and, uh, Mm, and also the uh, mm, yeah the, the ongoing colonial violence. It's the first thing uh, to say. But uh, another mm, important thing uh, to mention is uh, are the more the more recent things. And I also wanted to circle back to uh, Strelka, at which uh, has uh, been and like which uh, among with uh, multiple other mm, institutions uh, which uh, they have always worked with <laughs> they have mm, worked for a while as well as like to, to name uh, Garage and VAC Foundation. Uh, these are uh, institutions uh, that uh, were designed to perpetuate to, which were framed as like the process uh, mm, framed as perpetuating progress and European values and stuff like this uh, by mm, and uh, through these uh, visions of uh, moving towards progress and moving uh, culture towards progress uh, or towards like Europe and progress they also um, mm, in their politics they mm, concealed uh, and they uh, made violence possible, I would say. And yeah, so there, there is uh, really a lot to talk about, but I wanted uh, to also ask Anna if you want to say something. <laughs> something you, yeah. You say, yeah, I know you certainly would. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to mention that there are a lot of uh, calls, in one of which I participated personally to boycott cultural institutions. And I wanted to briefly explain why also as a Russian, I feel it's really important to do so. Because don't be mistaken, 
these exact institutions have censored very actively any attempts to do any decolonial work inside the country for the whole duration since the invasion actually started in 2014. This is not something that started yesterday. It's not that they didn't have time or they didn't have resources to address, no. They deliberately wanted to silence those who were ready to bring decolonial voices in the institution and instead they piled up all the like statements supporting annexation of Crimea, invasion in the east of Ukraine, those like subtle things that we have as screenshots probably somewhere in our archive, is very like explicit, even though today those institutions might post a black square on Instagram. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, and the spectrum of this colonial violence like spans from those like more subtle, more subtle um, shades to more explicit fascist resentment that is also present among the Russian artists and has been not countered because Russia until recently has been safe from those political demands that are usually applicable to artists and people in Europe. Like Russian artists always had this pass to like not be vocal against injustice, not be like uh, woke, shall we say, which gave the birth to insane genuinely fascist um, voices like the art platform Svitnik, which has actually been expressing support for the invasion, which is still supposedly fi um, considered fine within the uh, cultural institutions and other artistic circles. So I want everyone to be attentive when they engage with the Russian culture towards where do they stand in this, um, uh, like do they express actively that they oppose the invasion because if they don't, it says a lot, like their silence says a lot. Um, and then I wanted to go into how there are certain ways that uh, colonial regimes support other colonial regimes. Um, such as in the case of Germany exempting gas, uh, exempting it from sanctions. Um, perhaps in Spain there's, there's something, something else or some other examples. Uh, but for those of us in these regimes, how do we then start to become aware of them? How do we then start opposing them? Um, I think this is more for Anna. <laughs> yeah, I have my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to say that um, essentially it's not news that Western colonialisms actually do not contradict Russian colonialisms, that actually they very nicely collaborate with each other until obviously they try to conquer the same territory, which is not the case at the moment. So it's been the thing with the Russian colonialism that it's been using or like... Um, appealing to U.S. colonialism to, like, cover itself. And it's always been, like, all the... Um, since the Soviet Union, when they started denouncing uh, Western imperialism, imperialism was always meant to be in the West. It was never meant to be applied as a conceptual framework towards Soviet Union itself or later towards Russia. So U.S. is also actively using Russian colonialism for the same very reasons to say that U.S. colonialism is somehow better than Russian colonialism. It's always the case that empires always talk about each other. They never talk about themselves. Even I'm based in UK now, even Great Britain, which is supposed to be the symbol of imperial domination, like what can be more imperial than Great Britain, still UK managed somehow to post reports somehow saying that they've never been a colonial empire. They were always treating India nicely. They were bringing all the best stuff to India. So this is something that has been historically happening over and over again. And people who think that somehow, because you ask as a colonial empire, Russia cannot be as a colonial empire, 
are deeply mistaken on the depth of a collaboration that imperial regimes have with each other. It's not a coincidence that Germany is buying gas from Russia. It's not that Germany had no idea what Russia is doing or that U.S. is now imposing sanctions and not like two years ago because they didn't know Russia is invading. U.S. as a military enterprise is studying closely every Russian colonial invasion and reforming their military and army based on that. They have reports from the Russian invasion in Chechnya in the 90s that were at the base of the developed doctrine of the war on terror. The war on terror rose from the Russian colonial invasion of the 90s. So those empires um, actually collaborate very closely, which we should address in its like complexity rather than like try and um, portray this like um, unilateral as like power unilateral world where only one super power dominates. Yeah, thank you. I think also I wanted to address with Sasha the the distributed solidarity that then can potentially arise. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to, yeah, to continue on that and to say that uh, in order to, like, what I, mm, I think I see as a way to counter multiple uh, colonialism is uh, create uh, the, uh, the relations of uh, solidarity and uh, to, to uh, think of uh, the colonial resistance uh, of, uh, that, uh, that uh, doesn't centralize uh, American or European colonialism, but sees them uh, as, uh, as Anna mentioned, as uh, something that uh, working together. So uh, basically, like to say it, uh, to put it the most plenty possible. So if empires work together, then uh, why shouldn't we, like why shouldn't we? Uh, that if uh, empires uh, collaborate and if empires create uh, these uh, enormous infrastructures of um, mutual support, then uh, perhaps the only way to counter these infrastructures of uh, mutual support is to create uh, decolonial infrastructures and uh, which would uh, would make uh, the uh, would make the finitude of uh, colonialism possible and <laughs> possible as soon as as possible, really. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like that's a really good uh, end. But Essa, we invite people for discussion. Informally. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a long ride, apparently. Going to fun. Yes, positive notes. Just read.